I didn't want that to end. It was fantastic. <laughs> you always like to follow someone who's just a little less enthusiastic, but here I am. So um, first let me say thank you, Mackinac. It's the only place in the world that I've ever gone to where uh, 20 miles away the temperature is 30 degrees more. And <laughs> Fortunately, today it's chilly outside, and so there's more people in this hall than I expected to begin with. So thank you for staying. Number two, Sandy gave me a call just two weeks ago, and he said, um, what are you doing? Are you coming up to Mackinac? And I said, I am. He said, um, I'd like you to speak. And I said, Sandy, I mean, it's like a week or two away. What's going on? He said, well, you know, the speaker we had for this slot had unfortunately had to cancel, and we're looking for, you know, someone like yourself, a, a pigeon that can come and try to <laughs> close, the, uh, close the day. So we're in the ninth inning today. And when it comes to public speaking, pinch hitting has its advantages. I'm the pinch hitter. There's pressure, but you don't have to agonize over it because you don't have the time. And the term comes from baseball. The manager sends up a substitute batter to make something happen, especially when the team is in a pinch. Pinch hitting is all about opportunity. It's about professional courtesy. It's about pressure to perform. And that's the situation we're in today at the state of Michigan. We're in a pinch. My father had sage advice for me one day. He said the surest way to bring about change is to resist it. And that's what Michigan's been doing for a very long time. We have been resisting change. U.S. News and World Report, in association with McKenzie, a very well-respected research and consulting firm, produces the best state rankings. Now, when you think about why Amazon Headquarter 2 didn't include Michigan in its top 20, you don't have to go any further than this assessment. All of the reasons why are there. Michigan, on that assessment, is ranked 36th out of 50. We're in the middle of the road in some very important categories, like opportunity, economy, and quality of life, but only in the middle of the road. But we're at the bottom, almost the very bottom, when it comes to the most important things, infrastructure and education. Education is by far the most critical issue facing us today. If our workers do not have the productivity, the proficiency, the knowledge, and the skills necessary to compete in today or tomorrow's global economy, we will never be able to take advantage of all the emerging opportunities that are on the horizon for us today. Bumpy roads, traffic congestion, out-of-date mass transit will seem like a minor headache in this state that's going to be left behind. I say we have a real migraine headache going on in education. Walbridge builds large and complex manufacturing factories around the world. We install robots, sophisticated machinery, and we end up maintaining the plants for long periods of time. And when the time comes, we tear it all down and start again as we did with the GM Willow Run plant, which has become the American center for mobility, a remarkable success for our state. You may think of construction as an old school industry, but knowledge in our business is expanding so rapidly that we hardly build the same thing the same way more than once. Each project becomes a study unto itself using critical observation, lessons learned, problem solving, continuous improvement, and innovation to do it better, faster, and less costly the next time. Are we doing that with education today? We haven't for the last 30 years. We integrate, Walbridge does, with the entire supply chain in ways we could never have imagined just a few years ago. And with such tremendous potential and opportunity that makes my head spin today. That's the gold standard, and that takes a lot of really smart people. The foundation of all of this, the one thing that makes it possible for us to perform at that kind of a level and take advantage of the change is skill, experience, and knowledge. And I want to key on knowledge for just a minute. 
Where have all the jobs gone? In my industry and many others across our economy, the, un, the reliable, unskilled job is being eliminated at an unprecedented pace today. In a 2016 study, Georgetown University concluded that of the 11 million new jobs created from 2008 to 2016, 10.2 went to workers who continued with their education after receiving a high school education. Almost all of those 10.92 million went on to college, military service, apprenticeships, or trade school training, obtaining certificates and degrees in whichever uh, discipline they were in. Only 80,000 of the new jobs went to workers who stopped their education after graduating from high school. Just think of that statistic for a minute going forward. And so what do we have today? Today we have a shortage of 500,000 engineers in our country, 800,000 skilled tradesmen in the construction industry, and millions of other skilled jobs. It's a crisis that can no, no longer can be uh, ignored. And even in our own state, there's 65,000 unfilled skilled jobs. I just heard this morning that in Macomb County, it's 17,000, and that came from Mark Hackle. So what does Walbridge need going forward? We need electricians who can do an algebra equation, because that's what you have to pass on your test to get into the apprentice union. We need plumbers who can read a complex set of engineering drawings. We need millwrights who can measure and place heavy machinery to a tolerance of one or two millimeters. That takes a quality education. It starts at PK3 and continues for life. The McKinsey Global Institute predicts that advances in artificial intelligence and robotics will have a drastic effect on everyday working lives, comparable to the shift away from agriculture societies during the Industrial Revolution. In the United States alone, between 39 and 73 million jobs stand to be automated making up around one-third of the total, total workforce at that point in time. That's in 12 years. 12 years is like tomorrow when it comes to education. And today, 81% of all workers surveyed by SEMCOG, and just as we reported last week, surveyed said that they didn't believe their jobs are at risk. But the expert disagreed and say we are going to displace over 3.2 million lower skilled jobs per year for the foreseeable future. What you just saw in the background is the factories that companies like my build. There are no people in them. I don't know if you noticed it, but in a whole one minute slide, there was three people. Those jobs are gone. High paying and creative workers will be at a premium. So how can there be a crisis when so many people don't believe that we have one? America's transition out of an agricultural economy served as a valuable historical precedent for us. When we take a closer look, we find that the Industrial Revolution created as much opportunity as disruption. Approximately 100 years ago, only 18% of children went on to high school. And then the United States had invested very heavily in K through 12 education and, by, and, and in higher education. And by 1940, that number had increased to 73%. That was unheard of in human history. The resulting increase helped fuel a booming manufacturing industry and created the strongest middle class that the world has ever seen. And here's what's interesting. Michiganders, freed from the daily labor of the farm, contributed far more than their share to the industrial, scientific, and cultural advances of the 21st, 20th century. We were ready for the disruption. We put the world on wheels. We invented the assembly line. We pioneered life-saving medicines. And we introduced audiences to the world of Motown. When the opportunities of a new century appeared we were ready with strong high schools, land-grant colleges, and universities doing tremendous research 
assisting our progress. All of these new industries and products were advanced by innovation and knowledge. Can we say the same today for our K through 12? Can we say the same today of our community colleges? After World War II, the GI Bill helped continue the momentum, making the United States the richest, most powerful nation in history. And Michigan was ranked in the top five of all states in almost every important category, and for sure in income per capita. We were the arsenal of democracy. What happened? We need that same kind of investment today in education. We need to have 73% of all children going to college and the balance receiving other forms of workforce readiness, training through apprenticeships, trade schools, and military service. We need some kind of good old-fashioned courage and leadership to make K through 12 the top issue in the upcoming elections. Information and knowledge are growing exponentially, and you've heard that in every single session today. Everyone knows Moore's Law revolutionized computers and cell phones. It essentially said it doubled the speed of the processor at half the cost of every 18 months. Few have heard of Buckminster Fuller. Anybody know who he is? He's the guy who created the thing called the knowledge doubling curve. And he found out and realized that in 1900, human knowledge doubled about every century up to about World War II. After that, it doubled about every 25 years. Today, all human knowledge is doubling about every 13 months. Just think about that. It was mentioned today that in 13 months, everything that you know is only half of what you really know at that point in time. And if that's not enough to shock you, here's the real killer. IBM predicts that the Internet of Things will lead to the doubling of knowledge every 12 hours. How far away are we from that? Try and imagine that and the kind of disruption that will take place and what role continuous learning will play in all of our lives. Now let's talk about K-12 education in Michigan for just a minute. So against that whole backdrop, have we adequately and properly prepared the workforce for opportunities and challenges that we know are coming from ahead? Have teaching methods and materials kept pace? Does every child have an iPad at age three? My grandkids do. Your grandkids probably do too, but what about the other 1.5 million kids that are out there? Learning today is too passive, it's too static, and life is highly dynamic, it's highly disruptive, and at the end, it's very intense. Given this pace of change, where is Michigan in education? We all know that in 10 years, it's gone from 13th ranking down to 36. Unresolved structural problems in the financial system have delayed the kind of change that we actually need. We're the only state in the union that basically has no population growth. To prove it, Michigan has lost four congressional seats over the past 30 years. A consequence of this, no growth, we're no longer educating 2 million K-12 through kids, only 1.5. That 500,000 missing kids has put enormous financial stress on each and every school district. We need to solve this now, not next year. We also have massive deficits in the teachers' pensions, which I remind you are protected constitutionally. We push this can as far as we can down the road. We need to solve the neglects of the past. We can't continue to shirk the responsibility of finding a bipartisan solution. Or we can become another footnote of history. And people will say about Michigan what they said about Rome. Rome burns while we fiddle. There are three slides that I want to show you about just how far Michigan has fallen. Remember, we were as high as 13th just 10 years ago. Now, I'm not going to spend a lot of time looking at these slides, but it shows the funding gap between the highest and lowest poverty districts versus outcome. So the blue line are the high districts that we spend a lot of money with great outcomes, and the, blue, and the orange line is the poor districts that have less money being spent 
and as a result, they have bad outcome. Now, I'm not here saying that money is the all of, uh, end of all, but it's certainly something that we have to solve as a state. Now, when you look at this compared to the rest of the nation, uh, how their gaps are, look where Michigan is. We're like almost to the far right. We're falling off the charts again. And then when you take a look at advancement, AP advancement, advanced placement, again, we're lagging the nation. We're all the smart kids. They're not here. They're going away. Now, Business Leaders for Michigan is working on an education strategy that is founded on four basic principles. The first is maintain high student standards and existing state assessments. The second is prepare school, teachers, and professional development and access to technology and data. The third is ensure adequate dollars are being spent effectively. Now we had to choose that word very, very carefully because it's probably a combination of spending money better and spending more money. And we've got to get, we've got to find a place to get that more money. And I know we're all against more taxes. But I don't see it as a tax. I see it as an investment. And if we don't make this investment like our state and our country did 100 years ago, we are going to become the backwater of this nation. And then finally, there's uniform accountability and performance standards. So important. We need to find a way to either reconstitute bad schools or close them. I hope that BLM takes a page out of the Coalition for the Future of Detroit School Children's Playbook and builds a wide, cohesive, collaborative coalition figuring out how the 70% of the agenda that we all agree to can get it done and leave for another day the 30% that we don't. Traditional public schools are here to stay. So are charters. They absolutely need each other. We need the competition. But the playing field must be level. Funding must be fair and equal, sufficient to get the job done. Special edu education inequities must be resolved. They're very, uh, very poorly administered in terms of how the money is spent. It's federally mandated that we spend almost $40,000 per kid, but we're not funding it to $40,000 per kid. And what ends up happening is, is they take money away from the regular student to fund the special ed. We've got to stop that. We've got to fund special ed the right way. And we must return teaching to a respected and desired profession with fair pay and mandatory professional development. The reset, as I call it. I have a question for you to ponder. Has the depth and understanding of this crisis reached the tipping point necessary to effectuate a groundswell of popular revolt and cultural revolution on a scale of the one caused by the Industrial Revolution. We've seen evidence of that all day today. Artificial intelligence and robots will create as much opportunity as disruption. There will be entirely new industries and products created but here's the key and the thing I want to say about my whole short presentation today. Only knowledge will bring this opportunity to Michigan, as it did at the turn of the 20th century. And the only competitive advantage is our ability to learn faster than the competition. It's that simple. And I want to say it one more time. Our only competitive advantage is our ability to learn faster than the competition. It's that simple. And when you look at those three previous slides, you wonder how we're ever going to get there. I just don't get it, why we can't solve this. In fact, it's why I'm pinch hitting today. Then it struck me, we're all pinch hitting. If we want to change the outcome, it's squarely dependent on us. Now, I know there's only 1,600 of us up here, and there's 10 million in the state, but if this group doesn't take this up as this serious challenge, I don't know who will. We're up to bat. The question is, are we going to strike out? Or are we going to hit a walk-off homer? Do you have the courage to stand in the batter's box, stare down a 100-mile-an-hour fastball, and make it happen? All I can say, it's in your hands, it's in my hands, and failure is not an option.
That's it. 